All the people in the building, y'all. Y'all saying, where is pastor? Pastor is here and church is not closed, honey. The close sign on my door. I had to tear it down. Listen, y'all. I don't even have a voice right now because I have been in here crooning and singing Mickey Howard songs since this morning. We know that the church, the vestibule, the parking lot, every doggone thing is going to be full tonight because we have got a legend in the building coming to spend some time with us. And y'all know how we do it over here at Funky Dineva. We don't ask the questions and the information that you can find out on Wikipedia. We ask the real tea, the things that people really want to know about the everyday lives of these celebrities. And uh, my publicist already had the opportunity of talking with Miss M uh, Mickey Howard and her people. And they said that we can talk to Mickey about anything we want. She gave me one thing that we can't talk about. It ain't even really relevant, but we are going to have an amazing time. And I am so glad that y'all are here to join in this with me. I want y'all to understand what y'all are witnessing or about to witness. Um, if somebody, if my publicist reached out to me right now and said, uh, Funky Dineva, we got an inquiry um, for you to interview Cardi B, Meg The Stallion, uh, Saweetie, Sexy Red, uh, uh, Nicki Minaj. If they would have said to me right now on Wednesday, March 5th, you have the opportunity to, to interview Nicki Minaj or Mickey Howard, which one would you choose? Hands down, I would choose Mickey Howard. Y'all don't know what the moment we're about to have means to me. As a, a, a little black boy growing up in inner city Miami, listening to artists like this growing up, never, ever, ever in 10 billion years did I ever think I would be breathing the same air with Miss Mickey Howard, yet alone having a conversation with Miss Mickey Howard, who just logged on, by the way. I'm going to give her a second to go ahead and get her camera and stuff together. But we are going to have an amazing time. I'm going to see if I can get her to sing. All of us over here love under new management. I want y'all to drop down in the comments and let me know what your favorite Mickey Howard song is is, hey, Miss Mickey, I see you. Go ahead and get yourself together and just wave at me when you're ready to come on. You, you're going to get your water, use the bathroom, you're going to get everything together. And uh, as soon as you come back on, we'll get this thing started. And we are going to have so much fun. I was going to get into some topics, but since our sister already, well, you know, we'll get into one topic while she go ahead and get herself together. Child. We just can't win for losing over there with them real housewives of Atlanta people and Peter Thomas. Ch well, hold on, hold on. Let me back up. Y'all got on me about my cup that I was drinking out of and had me order a Stanley. Well, apparently y'all didn't tell me it was different sizes. And now I got this big ass damn cup. This cup so damn big. It's big and it's heavy. My wrist. My wrist is going to be strong like Arnold Schwarzenegger from trying to sip out of this big old black cup. But I guess this is better than me drinking out of a doggone Taco Bell cup. Well, it ain't because I ain't going to clean this one either, okay? If I'm only putting water in it, all I'm going to do is take the top off and put water back in it. But anyway, speaking of putting water back in it, somebody need to put some life and some water back in to Peter Thomas because Peter Thomas is now being sued for $9.1 million for defaulting on his lease at his Bar One location. And he also was getting ready to open up a separate diner's club. And they, uh, he signed the lease, put his stuff in there, but never truly got the place open. And the people are suing him for the 120 months worth of lease payments that he would have had to have paid those people in an equals $9.1 million. Now, a lot of y'all might not understand what a default judgment is. A default judgment simply means Peter didn't go to court. <laughs> he said, to hell with y'all hoes. He said, 
to hell with y'all hoes. Y'all can kiss my ass. I ain't got it. I ain't spending no money on no attorney because I ain't got no money for that. Um, I took out all these leases under LLC anyway, and you are not going to be able to come sue me, so I don't give a good goddamn and good luck. Now, here's the thing, right? The 120 months worth of lease, at the end of the day, a contract is a contract, correct? But I do think that it is unreasonable for somebody to try to sue somebody for the whole duration of a lease, especially because they never even, you know, opened up the business or took residence. Now, I can understand if he had a five-year lease, he had been there for three and a half years, and he had another year and a half on the lease left, and then they sued him for that other year and a half. I could understand that. All right. But he never moved in. So to, to try to make that man responsible for five years at least, if anything, as a penalty, the judge should have said, OK, we'll make him responsible for one year of the lease, because the reality of the situation is that building is not going to sit vacant for five years. All right. Or for one hundred and twenty months. So the business owner who owns that business, if they were successful in collecting that money from Peter, they honestly would be double dipping. Um, the thing that bothers me now is that, you know, Peter makes his bread and butter from the restaurant business. And one of the downsides about being a celebrity and being popular is that now, Peter, when Peter walks into any place to kind of do business and they Google his name or if anybody recognizes him, unfortunately, his name and his brand is kind of synonymous with businesses that don't stay around long and then end up in some type of financial jeopardy. So I'm curious to know what Peter is going to do moving forward when it comes to income because the restaurant situation is not working. So maybe he'll go become a general manager at Olive Garden or Red Lobster or something uh, <laughs> of the sort. Um what else was I? Oh, let me get back, child. I didn't even put the, uh, let me get in here. Get in here real quick. Copy. Sister Howard, you ready for us to bring you on? Because if you ready, we ready for you. All right, I'm finna bring you on in 20 seconds. Can you see me? Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you the legendary, the incomparable Mickey Howard. <laughs> hey, Miss Howard! Oh my God! <laughs> What's going on? Listen, I I am having such a fan moment right now because I was telling uh, everybody before you logged on, if I had the opportunity right now to interview Cardi B, Nicki Minaj, any of those people, and they said. Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, or Mickey Howard, who would you choose? And I want you to know I would choose you over any of these new super pop celebrities any day. And here is why. You and your music was just such the soundtrack to my childhood and my teenage years. Like, I can just remember being in the car with my mom. We'd be leaving the mall at 8 o'clock and the quiet storm will come on. And it's the next thing I hear, experience is a good teacher. And to be here now, I never thought that I would ever be breathing the same air as you, talking with you, or even having the opportunity to, to meet you. So this is an honor. And I want to thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview with us. Well, certainly you have to know that I'm honored. This is so cool. I'm like, oh wow. <laughs> and thank you so much. I was so like she said, uh um, your uh, person said, Oh, we want to talk to you. I'm like, talk to me? Oh Lord, oh my God. I gotta my thing did something. Wait. That's all right. We we here, baby. We, we got all night. Uh oh, uh, wait, wait. Here we go. What she said, there's a light that can not shine. She had to go out, y'all. She finna come back home. No shade. Don't Miss Howard look a little bit like uh, Tokyo Tony? Sorry about that. Oh, no, you good, baby girl. You back. So listen, 
uh, Miss Howard, if, if I may call you that, uh, what would you prefer me call you? Mickey. Mickey, all right. Or Auntie Miss, Mickey. All right, Auntie Mickey. So I don't know how, if you know how we do it over here, Funky Dineva Live, but we we like to ask the questions and the real things that people want to know. We I, I, we ain't going to talk about stuff that we can simply find on the internet. We want the real, real. So we're going to start with your biopic, um, which from a fan's perspective was pretty entertaining and pretty good. Did you have any hand in the creation, the production, and the development of that film? Oh, yeah. I had a lot to do with it. We had a good time. Um, uh, yes, I did. In fact, you can see I'm one of the producers uh, on there. Um, I, I helped pick the, the actors and stuff. And the, um, the, the director um, is uh, Christine Swanson, who's really a major wonderful person and a fantastic talent. And she, she, we talked almost every single day for hours and uh, it was a wonderful experience. So yes. That that's amazing because so many times we see celebrities out there who complain about their picks because they say they're unauthorized or they didn't call the family, so on and so forth. And so, you know, there's no secret. The the uh, biopic opens up with you having a medical emergency, a drug-related medical emergency. And from the viewer's perspective, or at least what I gather from it, um, that, you know, Shaka Khan was your friend and she was your party buddy. Um, and it left me believing that she was the one who introduced you to party drugs. Is that factual, not factual? How does that relationship come about? She's the one that was willing to take the blame. Understood. You know Understood. what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was, you know, we were all doing whatever, you know, and um, I, I up until that time had been considered uh, almost a religious girl, you know, you know, because I didn't do anything and stuff like that. But she was the one willing to take the blame. I, I spoke to her um, when we were doing the movie and uh, we talked about, you know, we had certain incidents and certain, we were the closest, we were very mm -hmm. close. So I'm like, you good? She's like, yeah, just, you know, yeah, we'll do, you know, because it's important that um, artists as well as people know that you may have some times like that in your life and it doesn't mm -hmm. mean it's the end of your life. Mm -hmm. At that time, you know, I thought, you know, oh my God, I'm a drug addict. I'm now gonna be a drug addict <laughs> the rest of my life. It's mm -hmm. over, it's over, you know. And I really did think that. Mm -hmm. But had it not been for an, uh, you know, uh, Oprah show, which she had, in, in, I can never say it. Ms. Dr. Vanzant, when she would come on and um, talk about getting your life together and stuff like that, that, that that's why I'm like, really? I can really, this is not, this is just a stage? Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. So is it is it safe to say uh, you and Shaka are still good girlfriends to this day? Absolutely. Like that's um, like yeah. That's who 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 else are some of your good singer old school girlfriends that we wouldn't know you still roll and gossip and kiki with on the telephone? Oh my gosh, I have a lot of friends. One of my good friends is Sherelle. She's so funny. I love yeah. Sherelle. Okay. Oh, she's good. Mm -hmm. She's a she wonderful friend. She was around uh uh saving me when I was getting beat up by the mm -hmm. husband, and I didn't, you know. She would come. He was so scared of her because she was mm -hmm. a little uh, Detroit gangster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so we're still very close. Um, Allison Williams. Um, just call my name. Come on, Allison. Yes. Oh, uh, it's so many. If I leave somebody out, I'm gonna get beat up. Valia. <laughs> oh, my girlfriend Joy. I love Joy. Oh, it's just it's a lot of. of the, I love everybody. I love everybody. That that is good to know. Um, who is somebody that you met in your career, another artist, um, that maybe wasn't so nice to you? I'll put that. I you I you know your favorite <laughs> friend, your favorite single. She was not. She was. But you know, <laughs> it's you. I, I just put that to youth and folly and, and nonsense. But yeah, um, Anita Baker was not very kind. But it may have just been a moment. 
So you guys, uh, I mean, I mean, if you don't mind, sh- do you mind sharing us that interaction? Y'all, y'all had one bad interaction, or y'all had several bad interactions? Oh, it was mostly people. Always okay, people say- in the mix. Yeah, they want to say this or they want to say that, and and uh, I won an award at the Soul Train Music Award, and I've certainly uh, admired her, and I was so excited. And she came to me, she put her hands on my shoulders, and she said, whispered in my ear, uh, um, "You take that and and you." Uh, put it on your shelf and keep it dusted off really good because it's the only one you're going to get. Ooh! Were y'all in the same category that year or something? People always, you know, we're, just, we're feminine women uh, 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 in, the, in the same color scheme. So they always mm-hmm. do that. They always do that. They want to make you compare to somebody and make us, um, uh, uh, you know, enemies. It's, but you know what? That's really disappointing, especially considering the time in which you were really popular because when you look at 2024 and when you look at the 90s, there were a lot of you girls out singing now. And currently, you know, in the R&B landscape, there really is no one. Talk to me about your current thoughts on the state of female R&B and soul music. Oh, I uh, travel a lot in America then I get to see uh, a lot of artists that you don't get to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Washington, D.C., it's the place is flooded with fantastic, wonderful artists that you'll never hear. It's, mm-hmm. uh, I don't think it's the, the craft that's gone down. I think it's it's the, the people that are not making enough money off of it. So mm-hmm. they only give you like one or two or something like that. Like, I really enjoy... Um, uh, uh, Jasmine Sullivan. Mm-hmm. I think she's so soulful. I, I mean, you know, I'm 63 years old, so I'm mm-hmm. way past her subject matter. Mm-hmm. But you know, but I'm right. I'm crying with her. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. I remember those days and stuff. I think she's fantastic. And I'm, and her. And there's so many great artists and Moni Long and stuff. Uh, yes, um, she's yeah. another good one. She is another good one. I I would love to hear, um, you know, one of those girls remake one of your classics and something that always annoyed me with the newer r&b girls i i think the fans and it would be a great way to bridge the gap between the older generation and the younger generation i would love for a jasmine sullivan or for a money long to reach back and do a collaboration with a Mickey Howard. You know what I'm saying? Or do a collaboration with a Regina Bell. Or, you know, do you get those opportunities? Do the girls talk to artists like you about things like that? Or is that non-existent? These, uh, I'm going to tell you something, okay? In our trying to get, you know, confident and all that kind of stuff, a lot of the girls are arrogant. And really, they ain't got no reason to be because half of their ass can't sing quiet as skip. <laughs> They're kind of arrogant. I've been in the presence of a couple, and I said hello, and, because I love to fan out. Because mm-hmm. when people do that to me, I think it's so exciting. I'm like, oh, my God, are you out of me? Uh, you know, so I'm, I love to say to people, oh, my gosh, I love your music. You do. I mean, they don't know who I am most of the uh-huh. time. And and I've been, I've been really treated poorly by them, and I've gone like, girl, okay. And you know what? That's why half they ass can't sing right now, yeah, uh, it, it, because they don't know who artists like you are. And and I don't know what happened between the '90s and now. I don't know if it was the shift in radio play that a lot of these younger artists coming up. You're absolutely right. They have no idea who um, people from your generation are, and that's why a lot of them sound like trash. <laughs> Quiet as it's kept. My words, not yours. I love R&B music, but I'll be the first person to say that this new stuff that they got out on the radio, it just doesn't move me. It I want to mo- say something to that. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of great artists, and they're mostly great on their own. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I think Beyonce is the last of the trained artists, literally. I agree. That went to, you know... That is trained, you go to dance class. We had to be able to sing, dance, act, tell a joke, and have a time step. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm saying we, but I'm the last of that kind of generation. Mm-hmm. I went to I went to Fred Astaire's dance classes. Oh wow. Dance school. I mean, I was trained. I'm mm-hmm. a trained professional. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And these girls, or I won't say girls, a lot of the young people are not trained. Mm-hmm. 
They are just genuinely talented. And mm -hmm. they take that raw talent and it's and it's what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty cool. But if they kick it up a notch by investing in um other parts of your talent, they will see, oh my God, I didn't know I could do this. I mm -hmm. didn't know I could do I mean, we used to write our own songs. Do you you know? <laughs> These kids have an opportunity to make their own movies, make their own videos, write your own books, do everything you possibly can, you know, to um, expand your gift. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, and if they were smart, they'd realize that it would also give them longevity. Because a lot of these people, I think, you know, just because of the, the Internet, Instagram, Facebook and all these things, you know, they become super popular really quick but then they burn out because at the end of the day, there is nothing there. You're right. There is no development. There is no training, so on and so forth. Um, speaking of writing your own song, because that's very important, especially when it comes to um, earning potential and, and money that artists make in the future, did you ever find yourself in any bad record deals? Of course. Of course. I'm still in a bad record deal. There are no good record deals. Uh-huh. It's just, uh, I mean, uh, especially for uh, Black artists, African artists, African-American artists, which is one of the things that propelled um, the uh, uh, hip-hop era to go on their own. And then it caused a lot of violence in uh, in the record industry, a lot of violence, because they, they, they were from the streets, a lot of them, and they would say, uh, two plus two is four. I don't care how you say it. I want my four. Uh -huh. And they were and they were going in. And they tried the lawyer thing, and then they were beating up people and shooting and whatever it took. But the rappers got paid, uh -huh. and artists like me are 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 um, gosh, we had had a hard time. You've had a hard time. Um, and if I'm not getting too personal, um, without are are you able to live off of the royalties that have been generated from your past from your past albums and past music? Are you able to just comfortably live off of that? No. No, oh. I still work. Uh -huh. I still work a lot. I I would like to retire uh, mm -hmm. in terms of maybe the next three, three years. And I really envy the artists that come out and go, you know, I'm retiring, you know, and then they do lots of great big shows. And it's I'm like, that's great. Get your money. I'm not a person that believes in robbing the industry, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's fair for the industry not to uh, pay us, you know. Mm -hmm. But they do. This has gone on. It's just not been in. Uh, Music is it's gone on in film and the whole nine yards. And as of late, I've got more royalties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as of late, and I'm, I live a a meaningful life that mm -hmm. is comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And certainly, I love to make more money. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't we all? Uh, so let's shift gears a little bit because we can't talk about um, Mickey Howard's story without talking about some of her love interests. Would you describe uh, Mr. Gerald Levert as, as one of the loves of your life? Oh, yes. Would you really? Yes, mm -hmm. I do. Uh -huh. He was one of the first men. <laughs> he was such a young man. I feel weird calling him a man now. He was a <laughs> boy, practically. You know, this was the first uh, male relationships that I ever had outside of my family that um i felt somebody cared about me and he cared about me and you don't know that till all the way to the end he made a talk a little crap or whatever but he cared about me he cared about my children and when i had um dark times like oh i wouldn't say they other people may call them dark but they were so fun for me mm -hmm. because you know i had gotten off the little drug thing you mm -hmm. know you find out you ain't got shit ain't nobody <laughs> <laughs> and i got a little apartment in jersey city mm -hmm. And I just became an ordinary person. I mattered, you know what I'm saying, as a person, not as an artist, not as Mickey Howard, all that stuff. And Gerald supported that because I couldn't even get any work. I mean, maybe, you know, I, I went to Russia a couple of times. Isn't that awesome? weird, right? Did you, you know, to go to all Russia? the places in the world, mm -hmm. Russia calls, you know, and it, and it was just amazing. Just other things happened in my life that took me away, say, from the mainstream or whatever, and I couldn't really be suffering of the fact that, oh, I'm not doing this or that. I had a great time. And he facilitated that. Mm -hmm. He helped, you know, pay the bills, whatever. What you need, Mickey? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm in the house, <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Now I'm going to be a little messy right now, Mickey. 
Was there any overlap in your interactions with Gerald Levert and Candy Burris's interactions with Gerald Levert? Uh uh-uh. uh. Okay. No, we, okay. I, I, we um we would work after you know we had relationship and all that kind of stuff. We became extremely close because our children became close. We we came from not having kids at all. He didn't have any, and and I didn't have a daughter. You know, mm-hmm. I just had two boys. So we come from all the way. My boys being four years old. All the way till you coming way down the line now, because that's mm-hmm. from '87, and then you start talking about the '90s, okay, like mid '90s mm-hmm. and late. And no, we work together. Sometimes we do shows and things like mm-hmm. that. And certainly, I was a part of the family. Our children never let go of each other. Nice. Today is Lamica's birthday. His son, uh-huh. happy birthday, Lamica! You know how she love you. <laughs> I always love the women he was involved with. Because mm-hmm. um, you know, if you work together, you gotta go. We get the same hotel. We this, mm-hmm. we that. <laughs> it was um we were close mm-hmm. and 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 you can't all the time just sit out in public and talk so we be with each other's room or oh, what you doing i'm coming down to your room mm-hmm. whatever stuff like that he was a great guy for to me and he had um lots of girlfriends mm-hmm. and why not he was yeah. handsome and um well to do and a lovely person mm-hmm. good good to know um, you know, these days, social media and reality TV tend to play a large part of people's musical success. Um, would you ever consider doing reality TV? Like, like, would you have done a show like R&B Divas had you been approached? I've been um, contacted a few times. And I've certainly filmed, a, uh, you know, how they do the little t- whatever it is. Uh-huh. uh-huh with... Um, Mona Scott and everything. I oh, just wow. don't think I'm a good candidate because I'm very like, listen, um, ain't nobody going to make me do nothing I don't want to do. Uh-huh. And I'm not going to sit up and talk about these women with each other. I grew up, okay, with uh-huh. four sisters. I had four sisters on, on one side of my family, my father, and then I had two on my... I have six sisters. Uh-huh. I had. And they're mostly mm-hmm. gone now. And that's another reason why I don't do that to women mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. in general, basically, but... I'm not going to sit up and talk with you and all that kind of stuff. And you're not going to talk to me crazy all in my face, which they like to try to do. do. I don't have yeah. time for that. Uh-huh. I have a granddaughter, 19 years old, about to turn 20. Do I look crazy to you? I have four grandchildren. I have three children. I have a son older than you. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. older than you. Mm-hmm. 42 years old. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I can't do stuff like that. I I'm, feel crazy. Yeah. But I wanted to be on there because I thought maybe I had something positive. Mm-hmm. to give and then and they see that and they go i'm not a good candidate because you're not mm-hmm. gonna do it it's not gonna happen well you know hopefully you know I, i'll say this the uh over at the own network their reality tv shows tend to be a bit more on the positive side i mean listen you know the business it's got to be a little bit of mess in order to make things say uh sell um but just from me to you and seeing the personality that you have on social media I definitely would love to see you in a on a bigger platform in a reality television space. I think that there are so many, um, especially the younger generation. And, and if I could implore you to just reconsider at some point, they need you, girls. They really do. They 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 they, they do. I'll, I'll never forget um, Queens with cocktails was on and there's a new artist. I don't know if you know her by the name of, of Queen Nyjah. She was on and Selena Johnson told her to sing. She was like, okay, you're on a talk show now, sing. And she just choked up and got so nervous and just didn't know what to do. And I remember looking at her like, girl, you get one 15 minute slot on a talk show and you are a singer and you're gonna blow it and not be able to sing. And when me and Selena talked offline, you know, we both came to the conclusion that this is why the younger girls need the tutelage from the more seasoned girls like yourself. So I definitely would, uh, Mickey, if you get an they opportunity. Don't listen. They don't listen. Y'all need to be y'all need to beat them up or sit them down and uh put that good auntie knowledge on them or, or something. But they they need they need trust and believe they need to listen. And it's funny, I'll never forget I was watching an episode of Video Soul. Many, many years ago with Donnie Simpson um, and the OJs were on there and Donnie Simpson asked Eddie Levert this question. I was a teenager. I'll never forget it. He said to Eddie Levert, what advice would you give the younger 
people coming up behind you. And Eddie's advice was to study our longevity. He said, I would tell any of the younger artists to study our longevity. And I think that that's what the younger artists need from artists like you who are still around, who are still able to sell concert tickets, who are still, there's a demand for your music. The chat right now is blowing up <laughs> with people who wanted to come see this interview with Mickey Howard. So it's definitely much needed. Uh, but I'm not going to take up too much more of your time, Mickey. What do you got going on coming up? Where can we find you? Where can we see you? Are we going to get some new music? Uh, are you going to ever give us another album or has that day come and gone? Okay, one thing at a time. I'm going to be <laughs> in Atlanta uh, on April 18th and 19th at the City Winery. Mm -hmm. I usually perform at the City Winery, different ones around a lot. Um, look for me wherever, you never know, but mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely going to be there. Um, and do I, I would love to make a record. I've, I've been gathering material, but I sure hate to do, you know, they had this thing about songwriters last week. Uh, one of the red, something red, the uh -huh. girl, and she was upset about, um, people taking credit percentages. Yeah. That's been going on for many, 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 many moons. And, um, it was not necessarily a practice for new artists. Like when I came out with come share my love, right. In 1912, you you can <laughs> you can write like you know I didn't have the right to ask for a percentage of the song, no, because I was a brand new artist and and these wow. were brand new. But if I had been Aretha Franklin or somebody that was really popping, you know, that's been singing for a long time or doing these records or Whitney Houston, right? If she sings your song, you are automatically guaranteed a million seller, basically. It's, it's a difference. And they ask for a small percentage is not bad. Mm -hmm. It's not, I never did get to do it, but when they, when I got to that level and we talked, I just felt like I didn't need it. It yeah. just wasn't, but in, as far as business goes, it's not that unfair. If, if, if without this voice, your song ain't selling a million, then you should give a piece of your publishing. You know, it, it, it's, it's so funny because I, when I was watching her videos, and some of the artists that she called out, I'm like, I, my, my school of thought was the same as yours. I'm like, if your song lands in Beyonce's lap and she records it, I mean, girl, you know, 80% of a multi-million seller is better than 0% of a flop. Tell you know me what about I'm saying? it. So my, my mind was in the absolute same place. But, I, I, but, but there is an argument to be made to um, when I guess some people feel that they're being greedy, um, I, I, I don't know. I think it's greedy when you keep selling stuff you don't know nothing about. If you're selling your music, doing your music or whatever, and maybe you do some art or whatever, but when you start selling toenail polish and shit, it ain't going to be anything. <laughs> Don't you have enough? Aren't you making enough? The, it's ridiculous. I think that part is crazy. And, um, you know, percentages are relative. Right. To what you get, what you negotiate. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, Elvis Presley and his manager split 50-50. Ain't no bigger artist. Uh, uh, um, what's his name? Um, Satchmo, him and his manager did 50, 50. If a manager comes now and say 50, 50, when an artist, they're like, hell no, no. absolutely not. Who do? Okay. Mm -hmm. When you find out the work that goes into really managing an artist properly, you made me think that. Where'd you go? You gone? I'm still here. I was just giving you the full screen so people can get a full understanding of what it is you were saying. Um, oh, yeah. It's, it's negotiable. It's, it's what are you going to do and what you need. You know, what you need is more important because if you don't get what you need, you're not going to get where you're trying to go. You, go. you, you know, it, it's true. I mean, and, and, and there's an argument to be made because, listen, um, I, I guess what probably bothers a lot of people probably is the power dynamic aspect of it, right? Because if you walk into a studio and Beyonce's people, and I don't want to make this about Beyonce, any yeah, big yeah. artist, any big artist, and they say, you know, we want 20%, are you really going to say no? 
You know what I'm saying? You, you, I'm you, in, I, look, if I can, <laughs> if I can write a song and Beyonce say one twenty percent, she can have it. <laughs> I know that's right. I know that's right. Mickey Howard, this has been amazing. This has been amazing. I was, I was like, so this is excited. You know, I love you guys. I love all of y'all. I really do. I'm a podcast junkie. We love you more. And now listen, I I I I know some singers don't like this. Could you give us two bars of something? Maybe I'm in love under new management. Child, I can't have we sing that song when it's time to sing. <laughs> I don't feel that. <laughs> you, got, you got to give us a bar or something before we get off the line. Something. Oh, oh, wait, wait. I'm trying to turn. Let me see. Take your time. Oh, and she played the piano, y'all. Yeah. Whoa. Nah, it ain't that. It baby. ain't working today, baby. It She's ain't working. Whoa. <laughs> Listen. Oh, oh. I've been up and I've been down. I have I my feet. I've been up and I've been down. Hey, every ladies and gentlemen, Mickey Howard. Mickey, thank you so much for this. I love you. And listen, baby, anytime you got anything you need to promote, anything you need to get out there, my platform is definitely yours. And I look forward to us, A, meeting in person and us sitting down and doing this again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Fuck it, Daniva. Thank you. You have a good night, my love. Good night, darling. Yeah, Bye-bye. <sighs> Y'all, that was so much fun. God, thank you for blessing me with the way that I earn a living, being able to do the things that I do, meet people that I never thought I'd meet, have fun, earn a living doing it. I recognize and I do not take for granted that what I do for a living and how I get to move, most people do not. And for that, Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Y'all don't know what this interview just did for me. This is one of the second greatest moments um, in my career. The first would be when I did Candy's play, A Mother's Love, and I got to share a stage, y'all, with Shirley Murdoch and Eddie LaVert legends. And then now I just had a 30 minute conversation with Mickey Howard and the fact that she knew who I was and was enthusiastic to be here. There was SZA did an interview where SZA said she's already won XYZ amount of Grammys that really there's nothing more for her to do. They were asking her, you know, where else are you trying to go in your career or what's next? And she really was like, I mean, you know, I'm content. Um, and I understand that feeling so much. What just happened right now, I don't need no damn Emmy. I don't need no daytime talk show award like that. That shit don't mean nothing to me. I just got through having a conversation with the legendary Mickey Howard, y'all, and as much as I knew who she was, she knew who I was. I'm going to cry when I get off this thing, but I'm not going to upset my makeup and disturb my tears. Anyway, honey, um, let's get down to the tea. And y'all drop down in the comments and let me know. You know, I, I already said this, I think, and I'm going to use this interview with Mickey Howard because it went so well. Um, I'm going to cut it up, give it to my publicist. I honestly think that I am going to try to corner the market with bringing the old school girls to the present because mainstream media is not reaching out for them. And like Mickey said, she was excited to know that we wanted to talk with her. I think a lot of the girls that may perhaps feel forgotten or there's no real demand for them in the mainstream media, I think that we'll be able to garner them over here. And I think that that'll be a really cool thing that we kind of, you know, bring back R&B divas in our own way. I'm going to have to talk to Nikki Gilbert, who I should be actually interviewing next week coming up. But anyway, y'all, let's jump back into some of the topics. Um, 
I saw a clip today uh, that Taraji P. Henson said, black people run when we laugh because we were not allowed to laugh on the plantation and that those things are in us. Now, I had never heard of that. And I don't know if Taraji pulled that out of her ass or if Dr. Umar gave it to her. But Iyama Van Zandt always talks about how slavery and the trauma that we experienced, it reconstructed our genetic makeup and our DNA. Um, and so with that being said, I am willing to agree uh, that that very may well be possible. Same thing with a lot of Black people's fear for dogs. It comes from the fact that they used to always sick hounds on us from what they say. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm going to have to study it a little more, but y'all are dropping some great comments in there. I see Cheryl Lynn. I saw um, um, some of the, uh, uh, Regina Bell. We're going to get all the girls. Oh, I, getting Monica is not a problem. Monica's my girl. Um, but you know what? That was just very... Uh, Cure, that was very eye opening to me when she said that because that is a and, and when I thought about it, black people we are the only people who bust out laughing and take off running, right? And I just thought it was one of those just you know one of those things that black people do, one of those extra pieces of seasoning salt on our culture that other cultures have because. When we do it, it doesn't feel like a trauma response. It actually feels like us being extra and, and really embarrassing the person that we laughing at. When we, ah, we take our running. So I thought it was a positive thing. But to find out potentially, potentially, that it's one of those vestiges of slavery um, that's been passed down through our DNA and, and actually becomes second nature um, from fear of us being whipped, killed, or anything else in between. Uh, that's interesting. I'm going to have to confirm that that's true because lately people just been making stuff up and pulling shit out the crack of their ass. And I want y'all to know I see all the names that y'all are putting in the comments and those are all the girls that we're going to get. And I can honestly believe that we can get a hold of all of those girls with no problem. Uh, moving, moving right along to something else that was interesting. Now, y'all know I don't fool up too heavy with that Dr. Umar. But when you write, you write. And I saw a podcast today and Dr. Umar said that black men are to blame for the BBL epidemic because they constantly sexualize black women. He says that hip hop is largely to blame for the sexual objectification of black women. Do y'all agree? And before you answer this question, I, I, I want you to know that it, it, it's a trick question, right? Because on one token, I've seen a lot of women, y'all argue that y'all don't dress up for no man. You know, y'all don't get dressed for no man. That You know, how about you just, you getting dressed for yourself because you just want to look good for yourself. And then on one token, we're now saying, that black women are running out and getting BBLs because that's what the men want. Um, you know, I, I, ladies, which one is it? I, I, is there some truth to it? Um, I, I'm willing to believe that there is. He also went on to say that when you're a young girl and you turn on the TV and all you see on the TV is titties and ass and you don't physically have that aesthetic and, and you see that that's what what's, what's garnering the attention from everybody. Um, that's what you're going to run out and get. So, um, why you know, I, I don't think that black men and hip hop are solely responsible for it. Um, but I definitely think they are largely responsible for it. Let me ask y'all a question. And, and I don't want to give her this much power. Didn't the BBL become popular after 
Kim Kardashian did it, and then like Amber Rose followed suit. Like, isn't that kind of when it got popular? In my mind, I had always credited Kim Kardashian and the girls that were in the media during that time period as being responsible for the BBL. But I may be wrong. But I thought it was kind of Kim Kardashian, Black China, Amber Rose that set that trend off. So then the question becomes, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Did the women present that first and then the men were like, damn, we want it? Or were the men like, damn, we want it, and the women went and got it? Because when you think about it, y'all, if you go back to a 90s video, I love watching 90s videos you know what I'm saying? Like you just, just you know, Deborah Cox videos, Changing Faces videos, Coffee Brown videos, where everybody was just regular body. You know what I'm saying? Everybody had regular body. It wasn't a whole bunch of weave. It wasn't a whole bunch of makeup. Um, and again, you know, and, and, and I want y'all to know, I listen to y'all. Over the years, y'all have told me to stay out of women's business. And... It has taken me some time to recondition myself to kind of stay out of women's business. And I'm, I'm learning when it's okay for me to get in women's business and when it's not. And I recognize that I don't really get a favorable response when I begin to talk about y'all's image and how y'all look. Um, but if I must say, um, everybody going after the BBL Instagram look, um, I just think it's, it's it's lame, but for whatever reason, it's it's like everybody wants the BBL Instagram starter kit look, which is the titties, the flat stomach, the small waist, the big booty, the 22-inch weave, the red bottoms, the lashes from here to Afghanistan, uh, pancake batter makeup, designer clothes, designer bag. It's like, that's just the aesthetic that for those people who are into that thing, that's what they're all going after. Um, which is weird. And I see a lot of y'all in the comments saying, you know, it, it's, it's, it's low self-esteem. And I'm going to say this, and I, and, and I, and I need y'all to understand this. Um, despite me being a gay man, I'm still a man, and I still occupy a lot of male spaces. And I'm here to tell you, when you have on your tight jeans or your bodysuit and you walk in with your BBL and your big titties and your 22-inch weave and your red bottoms, yes, and your Cuban link jewelry, the men are looking at you. They are. But it's to fuck or to trick off on. Like, I promise you that they're not looking at, and I'm telling you what I know as a man, I promise you they're not looking at you saying, let's get married. They are not singing, meet me at the altar in that white dress. I promise you that's not what they're thinking. They are thinking, how many dates do I got to take this hoe on and how much do I have to buy to fuck her? And hoe rolled off the top of my mind because no tea, no shade. When men see that aesthetic, honestly and truthfully, they instantly throw you in the whole box. They instantly throw you in the whole box. And yes, they trick off on you. They may give you some money because they got a bad bitch that they trying to fuck. I'm just telling you. I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I know. All right. I'm telling you what I know. So it, it's, it's, you just have to ask yourself, you know, yes, that body and that aesthetic type, it definitely gets attention, but is it the type of attention that you want to get you the type of life that you want long-term? And with that being said, I'm finna back the hell up out of women's business and y'all can do whatever the hell y'all want with y'all business because my coochie made a clay, okay? And quiet as it's kept.
The real gag is y'all need to stop going and getting surgery anyway because the niggas don't even want y'all. They want me if you really want the tea, okay? And y'all ain't even ready for that conversation. <laughs> y'all ain't really ready. Y'all ain't really ready for this conversation. All these niggas gay, all of them. All of them, okay? <laughs> all of them gay. And let me tell you something, today, baby. You, you, yours can't do what mine. Yours cannot do what mine can do, okay? You can't compete where you don't compare, okay? And a lot of y'all be mad with the gays because your pussy can't compete with his preference, okay? <laughs> I'm just trying to tell you, bitch, and I ain't got to get no BBL. I just got the B the B, and the D, okay? I don't need the BBL. I got the B and the D, and that's all they want. I'm telling you, Bujana is the new black. Bujana is the new. B Let me tell you something. I can guarantee you this: boy pussy selling for more per pound than real pussy. I think. Uh, I think real pussy selling for about the same price as tilapia, but boy pussy going for what they sell mahi mahi for per pound. I'm just telling you. Don't get mad. Don't <laughs> Gidget said, I believe you. Gidget, I'm telling you the truth. Gidget, I'm telling you, I am telling you the truth, honey. I'm telling you the truth, Miss Gidget. <laughs> uh, speaking of the truth, let's talk about Jess Hilarious. Uh, which we call it said, move on. I'm gonna move on. Me and my bussy. I'm, me and my bussy. I'm going to move on. Me and my book. So, Jess Hilarious, I love the popularity that Jess Hilarious is gaining in all the media that she's doing. And I'll always support somebody like Jess Hilarious because she comes from the same space I come from. I love the fact when people who come from the social media space are able to transcend into mainstream media. She did an interview today when they were asking her about uh, something in her career that she regrets. And she says that she regrets when she was talking about uh, Chadwick, Chadwick Boseman and his appearance. And, you know, it, it, it's funny because a lot of us would be lying if we said that we did not have something to say or think something. Now, all of us may not have expressed it out loud. But she, you know, she made mention of the fact that I thought he was losing weight for a movie role or something like that, which is not far-fetched because we saw 50 Cent do that for that movie that nobody watched. And um, she says when she later found out that he had cancer, that it was one of those regrettable moments and she really felt bad about herself. Um and she had to reconsider doing uh, just the mess or whatever. And what I loved about Jess Hilarious in that moment was the fact that um, she didn't have her head too far up her own ass, that she was unable to be introspective. And I think that people, people love um, and connect with people who can be real and can be honest and you know hats off to Jess for owning that you know what I'm saying and it's, it's kind of like me she said she learned a lot from that and it's kind of like me with the the Chloe Bailey situation that I went through um you know I learned a lot from that situation because it 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 you yeah, when you had a whole world coming at you it ain't always easy um but you know it, it, it's one of those things where if Jess and I were friends, I would have told her, don't beat yourself up too, too bad about it because it was just a, a, a somewhat relatively human response. I mean, especially considering the fact that he had not disclosed his cancer diagnosis, which was his business, and he didn't have to. But the overall and overarching message is we kind of have to be careful these days, y'all, because... We never know what people are going through in their lives. Um, <sighs> I 
last but not least, and I'm hoping that me bringing her up doesn't bring her in our our uh, timelines any more than it has to. But Krishan Rock, girl, your toothless ass finna go to jail and your baby finna end up in CPS. Krishan Rock said her act, um, her act of warrants are being handled and that she did not turn herself in because she has a son. Girl, you will not be the first nor the last person who got to go to jail with kids. That's what they got families for. That's what they got social services for. That's what they got CPS and DCF for. Now, do not get me wrong. By no means am I implying that that girl's child needs to go into the system. She got 50, 11 sisters, uh, which is the damn system. Quiet as it's kept because I don't know if she's here. If your family produced Krishan Rock, your child might actually have a better life growing up in the system. Matter of fact, quiet as, oh, shit, I was finna say, the baby need to go around Carlissa house. Uh, I know it's just a child and kids is off limit, but I don't think that baby got a chance in hell. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I don't think that baby stand a chance in hell. The grandma fucked up. The, the son, the daddy fucked up. The mama fucked up. The baby ain't got no choice but to be damn fucked up. And I'm not wishing that on a child and get y'all super sensitive asses off my line. Y'all know I'm telling the goddamn truth. The likelihood of Krishan Rock's son becoming a lawyer, a doctor, an astronaut, a neuroscientist, an accountant, or anything productive in society is it's likely but not probable. You know what I'm saying? It's possible but not likely. I'm just saying. Uh, but, girl, having a baby is not a reason for you to not turn yourself in. It's the, the, the law do not care that you had a baby, and you didn't care that you had a baby when you popped James in the mouth, okay? And while I do not want her to go to jail for no extended amount of time, I do think she need to do 30 days. I do. There needs to be a severe consequence so she can understand you cannot walk around society and bop people in the mouth. Real life is not the Zeus Network, all right? Lemmy built a, a built a Lemmy built a galaxy where y'all exist in a world where y'all just walk up and fight people all day. But baby, when you step outside of that galaxy called Zeus, you are in the real world, and that type of behavior is unacceptable. And quiet as it's kept, this is one thing I don't like about um, bullies. And people who go around popping people, you know who to pop. She popped James because James was an, inf an, an infeminate gay boy. And she knew that it probably was not likely in James' character to be a fighter. She knew who to hit. Because you're going to fuck around and hit the wrong person and they're going to knock the remainder of them damn teeth out. And you already look bad with that one missing tooth. All right? Um, no shade. Blue face ass in jail. He needs to sit there and learn. And I take that back. Krishan ass need to go to jail. If for no other reason than to stay off our goddamn timeline, her ass needs to go to jail. And blue face being in jail is proof that it's their, you know what, they, they, they have a symbiotic relationship because y'all kept saying Krishan is the star. Blueface is nothing without Krishan. But now that Blueface has been in jail, Krishan has not been on our timeline. So what that suggests to me is that it's the negativity of both of them feeding off of one another that keeps them on our timelines. Throw both of their ass in jail. Okay, bitch, I need a three-year reprieve so I could bend that ass over and let my coochie breathe, okay? I need a three-year reprieve so I could bend that ass over and let my coochie breathe under new management, of course. Anyway, y'all, I hope y'all enjoyed tonight's show as much as I did because it was an amazing. I cannot wait to chop this up and, and separate the Mickey Howard interview from the whole show. Y'all be sure to like and subscribe. And if y'all want some more, you know, it's always a little extra incentive. If you drop something in the Cash App collection plate 
Now, we got these Asian people to help us get our church back up and running, but we need to rebuild our reserves so we can get their ass out of here. They're selling lo mein and house fried rice outside in the vestibule. Sister Wang is selling lo mein and um, veg vegetable fried rice. I think she said she got shrimp fried rice and a little pork fried rice out there in the vestibule and for $15 a pint. So if any of y'all want some Chinese food to take home to y'all kids because y'all don't want to cook tonight, uh, she got a few egg rolls left. And she said, don't come at her with that vegetarian shit because she a black Chinese and she don't fuck with that vegetarian shit. She got, uh, she got egg rolls with collard greens and yams in it. She got uh, collard green fried rice. They got little pieces of cornbread sprinkles in it. So the people is trying to work with our culture. We're going to try to work with them. The Chinese people help us get our church back open. We just got to work with the damn people. She probably got some general. You know what's so ghetto? I hate when black people say general tusso chicken. Tell me you ignorant and ain't never been nowhere without telling me you ignorant. Black people kill me with that salmon. For anybody listening to me, in 2024, if you are above the age of 21, there is no reason for you to still be saying the word salmon. And I understand that based on how we were taught to read and pronounce things, that the word really is salmon. Phonetically, it is salmon. But some of the nuance of language is that some letters are silent. It is salmon. It is salmon. Okay? And it's not general tusso chicken. It's general so chicken. They kill me with that general tusso chicken. General Tusso Chicken, girl. Touch your ass off my line. I'll call y'all hoes later. Bye.